Okay, should we get going? Um, so, go to the agenda. First up, um, Otto, he's going to talk a little bit about Nighthawk, which is um, an open source load test framework that uh, he's been developing um, with us for Envoy load test. Go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, well, I've been working on uh, a benchmarking uh, project. Uh, we call it Nighthawk. And um, it's based upon Envoy's um, uh, libraries. Um, well, and currently it's it's in like uh, in terms of functionality, it's similar to what WRK has to offer. It's it's still pretty early stage and simple, but um, um, it, it already performs fairly well. And uh, well, we've been you know uh, exploring various approaches towards to to how to uh, best implement it, and uh, I think that we're narrowing down towards uh, the right way to go with it. Um, currently, it supports uh, HTTP 1 and 2 over uh, plain HTTP and TLS. Um, it has um, uh, HDR histogram support. Uh, today, I've been looking into the uh, HDR histogram is, is able to, to uh, apply corrections to our measurements to uh, compensate for a f uh, for an effect that that's called. Um, um, I'm sure I'm not sure I forgot the term, but when you when when the benchmarking tool has to wait for the server before it can um, initiate a new request, that's a, it's kind of like idle and it's missing its timings. And uh, when you're not very careful, you will be not measuring at the time that latency spikes and uh, HDR histogram is able to hmm. um, apply corrections for that. But um, in any case, I, I looked- Well, we had an open loop design there anyway. Also, like the idea was we wouldn't be doing that kind of like closed loop thing. That, 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 that's right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, well, there's that. that, that's about where we are right now with this. Yeah, I'd also point out that this work's being uh, upstream right now into the Envoy Perf repository. Um, we're trying to actually get it to follow the best practices for development that we have in the main Envoy repo, including these like flag tidy and coverage. Um, coverage we don't have yet though, because yeah. basically this is, we have a giant ginormous hack to make that work in the main repo. We want to use native Bazel coverage support. And um, the person who's responsible for that has actually been out and they'll be back this week and hopefully we can get them to help us out to get, make that happen. But ideally we make this sort of a coverage driven effort and we get you know, similar kinds of you know, close to 100% coverage that we have for uh, main repo applied here. I mean, one interesting thing to think about might be is how we structure some of these ancillary scripts and tools which exist today in the main Envoy repo. We wanna use these in other repositories that we host under the Envoy proxy organization. It would be nice to may perhaps even have these as a sub-module which we share across them. Uh, because right now we sort of have a lot of sort of copy and plate and boiler, you know, uh, sort of boilerplate stuff. Copy and paste and boilerplate, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, so with the with the Perth thing, is uh, there a, like a roadmap doc that people can look at? Or is there, I'm just curious, is there something that can be shared with, with people just to see what the what the different milestones are and what our plans are? Yeah, I mean, we have a statement of work. We could turn that into, I think, a roadmap, essentially. Um, I, I mean, whatever's easiest. It could be a little roadmap. It could be even in the Envoy Perf, we could convert it into issues with some checkboxes. I just think it would be nice for for people to understand where the project is going um, so that people can comment if there's things that people would actually like to see. Yeah, maybe if we could take uh, all those features that we have in the statement of work and convert them into issues and like tag them at least with some notion of priority or um, you know likelihood of landing in the next milestone or two or whatever we want to call them. Um, yeah, yeah. 
that that would be great. And then also, I mean, in GitHub now, you can do project boards, you know, you can have milestones, you can have labels. Um, so that might be just a good way, you know, to, to generally track what people are working on in different milestones, just because as we get further, you know, we've talked about this offline. I, I think this project has the potential to become very widely used out outside of Envoy. Like it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. So it would just be nice for people to understand what's, what's going on. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, Otto already has some of those promising numbers, I think, yeah. around the latency measurement, and we're actually like better than some many of the other tools out there today. So I think this could be, yeah. Better and supporting H2. So yeah. Yep. Well, and H2, and then we'll eventually get quick support and a whole bunch of other things. And actually there's some, there's some nice synergies because if we want to load test quick, we'll need quick client support. We also need quick client support for running Envoy on the client. So, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of work that, that I, I think comes together pretty nicely here. Yeah, yeah and then and then one other thing, just just from a roadmap perspective, I, I'm sure it's not in the first version, but longer term, figuring out how we eventually, you know, get this into our CI system so that there's some way on stable resources that we can run, you know, even if it's not every commit, but just to look for like a like a weekly trend of performance so that we can see if we've had any major regressions on CPU or or memory usage. I, I mean, the, the benefit there would be so tremendous. This. Yeah, I would be excited yeah. to maybe use dedicated VMs for that so we can get some very Agreed. numbers. Yeah. 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 One one thing that we can talk about, and this will come later, is that CNCF does actually have a bare metal cluster somewhere. I, I, I don't actually know how one gets access to it. And, and of course, if you're trying to provision stuff on bare metal, uh, you know, there, there's like a lot of complexity there. But I, I think that even if we're talking just a couple of VMs or bare metal machines, you know, we can set up an environment with, which would give us stable results. Yeah, yeah. That, that's good. Yeah, I think that, that stuff's all gonna come a bit later. Like right yeah. now the scope of the work that uh, Otto and his team are involved in is largely just about the, the tool itself, but it's basically, it's, it's the enabler for building the rest of this. And uh, to the extent that others are interested in contributing to, you know, doing this um, infrastructure wiring job, um, uh, we would welcome. Well, and it's it's something that I suspect that once we get a little bit further on, we could have CNCF pay a contractor to help with some of that plumbing work, like because that's less systems work. That's more just tying it together into provisioning and CI. Not that it's not hard, um, but uh, you know, it, it's a different skill set, and we could probably get someone else to be paid to to do that. Sounds good. Cool. So, yeah. yeah, I wanted to add one thing. So um, uh, it's just kind of like a, for, for your information, but um, uh, I, I have this uh, latency tuned bare metal machine over here. And on purely synthetic benchmark against Envoy serving like uh, a static lorem ipsum file, the one uh, that, that was already in the Envoy repository, I get like super tight standard deviations like within 12 microseconds or something like that. And that's interesting because um, um, well, I think that if we can run bare metal in CI, we should be able to, you know, set a pretty tight benchmark there for us to maintain. Yeah, no, no, this is this is super exciting, and that's why you know, I mean, there's there's always a lot of public conversations about how uh, you know projects should publish perf numbers, and I'm I'm always saying that it's so hard. Like, I mean, it takes literally months and months of effort to to do this correctly, but we're we're actually doing all of the months and months of uh, of effort to do it correctly. So it'll be really amazing if in a couple of months we can we can get this working so that we have it in CI and have published results. Awesome. Cool. Thanks. Well, th thank you, Otto. Uh, Thanks, Otto. Yep. So, what do we have next? Um, uh, uh, certification program. Oh, this sounds exciting. Should Envoy have a certification program? See GitHub. Is there a test suite analogous to? This is to certify management servers or Envoy implementations? I have no idea. Are you on the call, Chris? We should 
probably just table this until Chris can come and talk about it because I don't, I don't, I, I don't exactly know what this means unless there's someone else on the call that that knows. Yeah, I, I was hoping we'd have an Envoy certified developer program and I could put that on my resume, but apparently not. Um, okay, <coughs> so CI update. Right. Um, so for uh, people out there, just uh, just. Uh, a uh, quick update. So you may have noticed that we have a lot of queuing or we should have had, we shouldn't have any queuing anymore, but we had a lot of queuing uh, before yesterday. To make a, a very long story short, uh, Circle CI was gracefully giving us free CI uh, for many months. And um, we reached a resource level with Circle where they weren't willing to give us any more free CI resources. So uh, that means that we need to pay for our CI. So uh, behind the scenes, we've been obviously looking at a whole bunch of different things from how do we pay for our existing resources uh, to you know how, how do we make our builds faster? How do we develop some tooling so that we don't run all of the CI jobs on on each PR or each commit? You know, so maybe have like a final test pass for a test that that you know typically don't fail if the main test pass. So things like Mac or compile time options or or things like that. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of things happening in parallel. Uh, we're working on getting direct funding for our CI bill. I, I, I don't want to share anything publicly about that right now, but I, I feel confident that, that we'll have the funding that we need. Uh, if you are listening to this and you are a company that uh, appreciates Envoy and you would like to help contribute to our CI bill, uh, please reach out to, to me or the maintainers. Uh, CI is probably uh, like the, one of the most valuable things that we do. It, it's not cheap, but it, it keeps our project at super high velocity. So if you would like to contribute uh, X dollars per, per month, uh, please, please uh, contact us. That would be great. Um, and then we're also investigating some things to make builds faster and stuff like that. I think Lizan is on the call. Do, do you yes. want to br briefly talk about what your thoughts are there? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, we turn so there's uh, like a couple items to make the uh, build, build faster generally. Um, we turned on the GCS cache back uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, so that's uh, how we set that up. So um, that one showing uh, very good performance in recent release runs that tur turns out that some some of builds finished in 20 minutes, uh, which was like uh, near two hours before. So that was great. Uh, I'm also um, had a meeting with the uh, remote build executor and gonna give it a try. Um, so uh, those are things that we, we are exploring currently to make the build faster. And there's some tech that can potentially uh, make the build faster as well that has failed the issues. Um, that's There's it. no di dynamic linking, right? Which we never... Yeah, dynamic link one is also the one. Dynamic link probably not, will not speeding up tests really much. I'm not sure. I, I, I will give it a try to see how, how that goes. Yeah. And using LLD is probably can make the release build linking faster. So that thing. Yeah, I mean that that one seems like a no brainer. Like it seems like yeah. even if we stick with GCC for now, we could yeah. link with, with with the other linker. Um, yeah. I you know, per other discussions, like I would be also I, I think we're reaching a point where enough people are using Clang now that mm -hmm. I, like I would be fine switching our official build over mm -hmm. to Clang. The only thing per our private discussion is, and, and for people out there is, I don't think we can stop doing CI with GCC. I mean, mm -hmm. I just think there's too many people that are, that are still using it. Whether we do, like we don't necessarily have to do all the tests with GCC. Like we could just mm -hmm. compile the server and just make mm -hmm. sure that all of the prod code compiles, right? Mm -hmm. It's not okay. it's not optimal, but I mean these are just things that I think that we could we could think through. I mean, I would be yeah, I would hesitate on that one because we've seen historically issues around things like different you know implementations of STL and that kind of thing, which have 
manifesting themselves in tests, in actual real test failures as we switch between the different compilers. So that seems, you know, if, if it was usually the case that they were producing effectively identical binaries and we didn't really ever see any behavioral differences, I would totally agree that why don't, well, let's not bother running those tests. But I kind of feel that there's been enough differences that we've seen in the past yeah. that we, sh we should continue to run them. Yeah, well, and, and and that comes actually back to uh, I think once Ite uh, develops some of that additional repo kitty tooling for us, like there's a bunch of tests that we're running now which don't really have to run on every single commit in every PR, right? So it's like you know some of them we may decide to really like only do on master merge. Some of them we could do with this magnifier thing on like risky PR. So I, I think the tooling will give us a bunch of flexibility to, to, to really cut our bill um, and, and also just make people faster because they're waiting for less tests, um, you know. On, yeah, push. agreed. Like some docs PRs, we don't need to even yeah. build a full the release right. and stuff. Right. Only docs. Well, well and, and, and those, honestly, we could fix right now because yeah. at the beginning of the script, for docs changes, you could just look and see if the diff only affects things in the docs folder, uh, and, and then like not not do certain jobs. So I, I mean, I, I feel like there there's a lot of low hanging fruit here. Um, yeah. You know, we just need to resource someone to to, to actually look at it. Yeah, I definitely like the idea of um, uh, of running most of. You know, most of the heavy tests only at least at the end you know when somebody says yep. okay this is really good to go 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 review it as opposed to as at least in my workflow i tend to check stuff that, you know make a pr so that i can see how it looks like in that context but i don't really need to start running the test yet we have That's we have noticed that because you are one of the heaviest ci users by by dollar amount <laughs> <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, right. And you know, I, there's just there, there's just so many wins here. Like it'll make people faster. And yeah. Great. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Should we move on to caching? If the, we're done there, or? Yep. Yeah. Um. Sure. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, Todd is not here this time. He we did talk about it two weeks ago, but at least. Uh, so we, you got kind of the intro, but now it's a doc everybody can get to. I think the easiest way to get to it, if it, you didn't see it on the Slack channel, is that it's issue number 868, and Todd uh, linked the doc at the bottom of that one, so you can open it up. Um, but I'll kind of go over the high points of it uh, really quick um, and see if there's questions. So um, the idea here is that uh, this is um, uh, uh, kind of a plugin-based architecture where the um, the proposal, and we don't have code yet to share, is that we would supply uh, an HTTP filter that would perform caching in Envoy, um, but it wouldn't have a cache in it itself. You have to plug in a real cache that you want to use. And so mostly what this doc specifies is what is the interface between this caching filter that we will supply eventually, and um, uh, you know, and the cache backend, which might be you know something that's proprietary in different networks, or it might be you know we could do something based on Redis or ATS or something in memory. And the idea is that you might have multiples of these and have multi-level caches, but that's kind of left as an exercise for the reader. So um, there's a few important points that I want to kind of cover in this uh, doc, um, which is that um, this is designed kind of to be performant at high uh, with very large objects and is streaming kind of at every level of the hierarchy. So um, if you have like a, you know, a huge object that takes a lot of time to stream it out through the cache, this works kind of in a similar way to the way that we fetch data from upstreams. Um, so uh, it doesn't block the Envoy thread and it will, it should work reasonably well. Um, it's also designed uh, with a lot of kind of wisdom from HTTP caching at Google, um, handling things like variants, um, which is actually a very uh, customizable thing, uh, range requests, 
the variants are, um, so if you don't know much about variants, variants are when you say, well, um, I'd like to send this response to, for example, uh, um, uh, clients that specify a, a specific HTTP request header in a certain way, but that's part, that'll become part of the key that, so you can pick an HTTP header that you want to become part of the key. And, um, and uh, a good example of this would be the accept header or the accept encoding header. And that way you could um, have responses that vary based on those and you have to specify kind of in your installation, which of those you care about for your server. So user agent might be one that people would consider, although that's generally a bad idea for front ends because there's a huge amount of entropy in user agent. Um, uh, range requests are super interesting for large content, especially video or for doing downloads. Um, and that basically says I can download a, uh, um, you know, bytes, 7,000 through 92,000 of this response. And, um, and then you can piece those together on the client, which is kind of how like resumable downloads work in Chrome, for example. Um, we discussed quite a bit, but do not have in the spec uh, anything about invalidation. That would be uh, if uh, um, the operator of uh, cache wants to say, let's, uh, let's toss out a particular result, that one's no good anymore that's gonna be kind of up to the implementer of the backend. Uh, the spec is agnostic about how that ought to work. Um, the spec actually used to be much bigger and we reduced it down. There used to be a kind of a layering thing where you could start with a very simple key value store with no knowledge about HTTP and, and all kind of the layers of uh, these HTTP specific things would be in there. That is currently not in this spec uh, we may do another spec which talks about how you could uh, let, you know, layer all the semantics that are required for this HTTP cache plugin uh, based on a key value store. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll be iterating on that and also iterating on um, getting the code, which is currently, you know, not in GitHub, uh, kind of, uh, uh, if it looks like we've got kind of alignment around this doc is kind of a generation, uh, uh, you know, and we kind of evolve towards uh, thinking this is the right way to go, then we'll start shuttling the code in that um, uh, has a sample filter or a very simple cache that implements it. So I think that's about the right amount of uh, background on this for this meeting, but I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. So for the for the general caching infrastructure, I guess you have some particular use case in mind. Do you uh, like? Do you plan on having uh, like there'll be the main filter, of course? But then you were saying that like, do you foresee having uh, whether whether it be Redis or something else? Like, do you foresee having some reference like full and complete implementation in the public repo, or or like do you think that people are going to have to go off and like build Build some backend, basically. Um, I I think we should we should evolve. Yeah, uh, yes, we should provide all of that. Uh, whether or not that will be done by us, yeah, um, or whether that'll get done by the community or somebody wants to pick that up, <coughs> yep. We'll have kind of a toy implementation that will definitely open source. That's just going to be a map, it won't affect anything. Yeah. Uh, then we'll we'll, we'll want to have something based on Redis or Memcached. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I mean, given the existing Redis support that's already in in Envoy, I I, I think doing doing Redis there would, would be pretty interesting because you yeah. can get Redis stats and, and like Redis clustering and like a bunch. You could just basically get it all for free. Um, yeah. So I it, it may actually not even end up being that much work. Uh, quote quotes, but uh, but it, you know it's something to think about. Yep, I agree. Redis is kind of the right first first thing to do. I also have one uh, question about uh, about uh, uh, the doc. So say that I would want to implement uh, a cache that um, actually is internal to Envoy in that filter. Um, currently, the threading model is that I think all outbound connections, all I/O is is uh, running on the same dispatcher and same thread as 
as the outbound IL, right? So the client and the server connections both are aligned. Um, and I was wondering if it's possible to do that um, when I plug this cache underneath, or will there be like um, um, thread switching going on? So what would the fast path look like? Um, yeah, we've talked quite a bit about this. I think that um, if you have, uh, you know, I think you could imagine one scenario where, where you would have um, uh, an in-memory cache per thread, but that would be a little insane because you would really get really bad hit rates. I think the um, most of our thinking is that what you would probably do is you would suffer some lock overhead when you used uh, an internal cache, but what you could do is you could program how much of that you were willing to accept by sharding the cache into as many shards as you wanted. And so if you have like a hundred core machine, maybe you would make uh, you know, a, a 19 way shard, sharded cache and you would get fairly um, uh, infrequent um, hits on that. I definitely would make those caches not too huge because you want to do most of the heavy lifting in, in some kind of shared backend like Redis and yeah. do that for the super hot requests. Okay. And um, another question that floated to the top of my mind when I read this is, um, would this uh, make, would this complicate life for plugin builders um, if there's like different thread involved or is the, ca is, is, is the cache like of uh, transparent to the filters running uh, up and downstream of the cache? Um, I would hope that it would be completely transparent to the other filters running in Envoy. Yeah, because that, that, that's because kind of in another server, I've seen that complicate life a lot. Um, and um, I think that, you know, the speed aspect aside, that's an important one. Yeah, um, if you, uh, if you, uh, it'd be great to see some comments in the doc about like how uh, the problems you've seen in the past with those kinds of uh, interactions between a cache and a server and other filters. Um, we should make sure that we, uh, you know, it's definitely not too late to try to design around that to prevent that from occurring. Okay. I'll uh, add a comment uh, on it. See if I can uh, contribute. Awesome. Okay, I think that's it. Unless there's anything else that folks want to discuss. See you all later. All right. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. Bye.